Stewardship. Yes, well. well, the lecture paid a nice net day. It's a homeless school assessment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, At the same time, the general public is being warned about sepsis and being educated about sepsis on how severe and how quickly we must address it how fast you must start IV fluids and give antibiotics, your patients are also being told how dangerous antibiotics can be. And so we're trying to educate both on the importance and some of the dangers of antibiotics. So I was going to discuss the stewardship of antibiotics. Antibiotic stewardship saves lives. That's the main focus of antibiotic stewardship. It is the safe use of antibiotics in order to save lives. Now, a quick presentation. Give you an example of a 72-year-old woman who frequently notices that her urine might smell bad. Now, she never has fever, she never has dysuria, never has pain, um, never has frequency, but a voided urine specimen will be relatively normal, but the culture always grows a germ. It grows a gram-negative germ or it grows enterococcus. And this lady's physician always prescribes a 14-day course of antibiotics. Now, originally, you could take an example of the germs that she is growing, and it will cover this entire plate. But then, if you drop onto the germs, antibiotic-soaked pieces of paper, so each one of those pieces of paper is a different antibiotic, you can see where it is killing the bacteria. So you could say all of these antibiotics could be used to treat this infection, and it would kill. But unfortunately, one year later, the same patient develops a high fever, low blood pressure, confusion, and she's going into sepsis and if we feel it's a urologic source, and when we grow it out, we now have a much bigger problem. The germs are growing over the antibiotics. So you would not choose this antibiotic because the germ is resistant. Now we might see we would use this particular germ, but what if I told you that the patient is now had been already allergic to those? So this multi-drug resistant is going to be an enormous problem. Why does she have multi-drug resistant bacteria? Maybe it was the nine other times she was treated for what, was, what I was describing as not a urinary tract infection. She had bacteria in her urine, it was asymptomatic. She did not need antibiotics for those others. The smell of the urine is not a reason to treat with antibiotics, even if there were bacteria growing. So this is to talk about what my patients are calling superbugs. Yesterday in the newspaper in the United States, they were talking about nightmare bacteria on the front page of the newspaper. So these multi-drug resistant bacteria is a becoming a big topic. And we have patients that are actually angry with the doctor if they prescribe them antibiotics to their grandmother in the nursing home, because they're saying, isn't the antibiotic dangerous? So you're seeing this all over the world. These kinds of headlines are grabbing the attention of patients when you see a new superbug is discovered right here in our hometown. But the question for, for your own community, these germs are just an airplane trip or a cruise ship away, right? Is that where the sources of these problems are? Or, is this something that is developing locally? So that's beyond my expertise. It's uh, something that your health experts are studying. And I appreciate your interest 
in this topic. So thank you, Dr. to for coming today to learn about this because is it both and how do we address it? Talk a little bit more about that. The answer to this question, who created superbugs? Okay, I did, right? I did. <laughs> I, I wrote the prescription for antibiotics. And, and even though I might have been treating it appropriately, I'm still creating resistant organisms. Maybe it was my hospital who didn't isolate patients properly and it spread from person to person. And I'll get to that later. And of course, it's the antibiotic. It's the overuse or using it when I should not. Like the first case I presented, they should not have received antibiotics and that combination of problems. Um, we are trying to teach our patients. <coughs> Every one of you here are teachers. You are teaching and educating your patients. And we find that antibiotics, we teach this to our patients, they are absolutely life-saving. The case of sepsis, where you have to treat rapidly, they are absolutely something that kills bacteria. But our patients might say, they treat a common cold? No, we, we have to educate more. In my community, we do not treat the common cold with an antibiotic. It is caused by a virus. Um, well, this is something we're not necessarily teaching folks on yet. Not everybody knows how dangerous allergic reactions, secondary infections with yeast, C. difficile colitis, which we'll mention later. They have those side effects. And, and this is not an issue about cost. In fact, if anyone mentions antibiotic stewardship, I'm saying it's about life-saving. It's not about saving cost and, and this, it's about saving lives and we need to emphasize that. Again, another example, a 72-year-old female, she has other conditions and I bring up diabetes and hypertension, maybe as she's caught a renal insufficiency also. She's admitted with pneumonia, she gets appropriately 10 days of IV antibiotics, and she is recovered. She is breathing back to her baseline. However, she was discharged with an additional 10 days of oral antibiotics, and I would say a poorly chosen one as ciprofloxacin. Seven days later, she develops diarrhea. Two days later, she's becoming confused, dehydrated. She is admitted with an elevated white count, renal failure. She has toxic megacolon where her colon has failed to work and she's becoming septic, dies. And I personally have seen two patients we tried to care for. The Clostridium difficile colitis was activated by the treatment and I would say the over-treatment with antibiotics. This patient did not need an additional 10 days of oral antibiotics. They did not need three days additional. They were appropriately treated with 10 days of IV antibiotics, and that could be even for some patients a little too long. So we are trying to get them to understand that yes, antibiotics kill germs, but they don't kill viruses or fungus. We, we do know that uh, they treat fever, but do they? Can you give examples of a patient presenting with fever whose blood pressure is stable, they're otherwise don't need antibiotics for just a fever? Our community doesn't realize that lymphoma can cause a fever. So this is something you can educate the community that not all fevers need to be treated, they need to be diagnosed. So it could be a drug reaction that's causing a fever, it could be lupus from the immune system. Uh, pulmonary embolism may be the source of the fever. However, if they're presenting with possible sepsis, you obviously do need the antibiotics there also. I will make the case that Antibiotics are a special medication compared to all others. For example, um, with most other medicines, if I give you a medicine for your high blood pressure, I don't expect your blood pressure to change. I'm giving the medicine to you, right? If I give you a cholesterol medicine, only your cholesterol is going to be lowered. Also, if you were to stop your cholesterol medicine, and a year later, I was to give it back to you, I would expect it to work just as well. But antibiotics are totally different. For you as clinicians, as doctors and nurses, when you give your patient an antibiotic, 
you could be affecting the life of another patient that you're not even treating. That's a very important concept for the general public to also understand, and us as clinicians, especially nursing students and, and, and physician students, that if I treat your infection and I create an antibiotic-resistant germ like C. difficile or something else, you could spread it to somebody I'm not even treating, and then that person is going to get sick. Plus, if I treat, if I treat you and then come back and treat you again, your sinusitis may be resistant, and that antibiotic is no longer effective. So why do we use antibiotics in the wrong times? In the United States, I have patients demanding that they be treated with an antibiotic for a common cold. A little sore throat that started yesterday, a little stuffy nose, I want an antibiotic, and I'm not leaving till you give it to me. What do doctors do? They write the prescription and give it to them. So we see this happening a lot. We also see that, look at, I'm taking a half hour to explain antibiotics and not to use them. A lot of times in, in my town, the doctors don't take the time to explain, you don't need this antibiotic for your child. Here's what we will do. We will monitor closely. You will let me know if things worsen. And if you do need antibiotics, we'll start. But for right now, I recommend against antibiotics because of don't want to create a super germ. I don't want to give you a side effect. I don't want to cause resistance. So we also know that we sometimes we want to do the best for our patients. So we end up giving an antibiotic that kills too many germs. You know, if we're going to be attacking an infection here, we don't want to be changing the flora that is helping the body in the gut. We also know that just because the antibiotic can be effective, we don't want to give the highest dose and we don't want to give it longer than we need to because those will also harm the patient. And sometimes we as clinicians, it's not my area of specialty, so uh, we may be needing to gas for help and get a consultation. So it's true in the United States that of all hospitalized patients, most receive an antibiotic. And unfortunately, when we review the chart, half of our patients in the US didn't need the antibiotic or it was the wrong antibiotic. That is, that's very alarming to us and we have not done a lot about it. So we are now mandated to have an antibiotic stewardship program within the uh, uh, hospital. Uh, I'm from Florida and um, I work at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, I'm the vice president of Lakeland Regional Health, which is another hospital in Florida. And of course, there's Mickey Mouse. So we have, uh, when you look at the entire strip between these two areas, there's about 3 million people that we're covering. This is one of the hospitals I work at, Tampa General Hospital. It's about 1,000 beds. Um, yes, it's on an island. Um, some of the doctors sun themselves here on the roof and live in the, in the area there. So it's a nice, very nice hospital. This is the hospital I spend most of my time at. It's about an 800 bed hospital in Lakeland, Florida. So we have an antibiotic stewardship program at both hospitals. So here's what we need. In order to have an antibiotic stewardship program, you must have the CEO, president of the hospital, board of directors, medical executive committee state this is a priority. This saves lives. This is causing unnecessary harm if we don't manage antibiotics. So we have written, written uh, testimony that says we support this, and this is a patient safety issue. We also make sure that every decision made has research behind it. It is evidence-based. We can show where it's worked before elsewhere, and we're always making sure it works here locally. We educate when you're hired and yearly, and we also document the uh, sensitivities of the antibiotics. So, um, so what we have here is an antibiotic biogram that you can carry in your pocket. This is for our hospital, no other hospital. So each hospital has their own. And I can see every germ listed down the side and every antibiotic. 
Now, I'll give you an example. At the bottom, Pseudomonas being treated with ciprofloxacin only at our hospital, only 72% of the isolates are sensitive, which may sound pretty good, but this antibiotic has 91%. So it tells me right there, if, I, if I'm starting to have the microbiology department tell me it's pseudomonas, I know there's an extra benefit in using this antibiotic here. Now keep in mind, ciprofloxacin for this germ, Proteus, also is pretty bad. It's actually worse, 60% of our isolates. So I'm starting to get the message, maybe I should not use ciprofloxacin as my first choice at our hospital. Your hospital may be different, but at our hospital, this is helping me. Now, you may think that this antibiotic is actually pretty good, right? 98%. But then look at this antibiotic, it's also 98%. The first one in red can cause renal problems when mixed with other antibiotics. It also kills anaerobic bacteria more than the other one. Maybe I'm not treating an anaerobic infection, so I want to avoid that first antibiotic and choose the one that is designed for my patient's illness. So I can't just go by the sensitivity, because we all get this from the micro lab on what antibiotics work, but you need to choose wisely, because if I kill anaerobes, I might end up with C. difficile, which I could really have that happen with any of these choices, but don't kill too many germs. That's the main point there. Um, so what do we do at our hospital? We started an antibiotic stewardship program. We had to have the right representation. So we made sure it wasn't a list of names. There are faces, real people that you work with every day that their responsibility is antibiotic stewardship. We have the president of the hospital in the middle. We have the infectious disease doctors. We have the pharmacist who is specialized in antibiotics. That's all she does every day is antibiotics. We have the microbiology lab, the quality investigators to make sure that that's working well and not pictured are the people who run the computer and gather data. This team meets regularly and they have the authority of the administers of the hospital to take action to help improve antibiotic use. <laughs> All right, so I mentioned the core elements of having expertise and to have leadership commitment. You've got to have leadership commitment and you've got to have physicians and nurses who are champions for the things I'll show you next, which are actions. But you also have to track, you also have to keep educating. Now, this education is different. You can do what I'm doing now and this does not help very much. However, if a doctor prescribes an antibiotic and it was the wrong antibiotic, I call them and I say, you know, you really should maybe use another antibiotic. It would be more effective. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Okay. I write that in a letter, in an email, and I say, it was nice talking to you today. As we discussed, you should not have treated with an additional antibiotic, but should have used this instead. I'm glad we agree. Very friendly. But if it happens again, it becomes a little less friendly. Okay, yeah, I'll leave it at that. You can see where that's going, but it starts off very friendly. Um, I'm going to now discuss here at the end, the, the last things I'm going to discuss is the, the actions our hospital has taken. Some of the actions may not work for every hospital. Okay, so specifically, we have a major problem with a 92-year-old who says they're allergic to penicillin, and there's no information in the chart. 20 years ago, somebody could have asked this patient, what's your allergy? And they could have said, when I was two, 70 years ago, my mother said I vomited with penicillin. We've got to document that in the chart today. We need to know the severity of the reaction, what was the reaction, and when did it happen? Because when you're labeled penicillin allergic, you don't get the best antibiotic. You may get vancomycin, which is not a good antibiotic. And any of you who are surgeons, you don't want your patient getting vancomycin when they don't need it before surgery because it takes longer to infuse. You could get red person syndrome where they may have, oh, it's a mess. And you, know, you don't want to do that. Plus, it does not kill as good as the penicillin families. We create our own guidebook for our hospital. If you come in with appendicitis, these are the treatments we recommend. If you come in 
with um, meningitis, these are the antibiotics we use. So that guidebook is there for you. Some antibiotics cannot be ordered by everyone. You have to be an intensive care unit doctor to order this antibiotic. You have to be an infectious disease doctor to order those antibiotics. So there are restrictions based upon the severity of the antibiotic. Now we have electronic health records. So this is gonna be something that you don't have now, but it could be the future, uh, depending on where you're working. So electronic order sets go based upon what the patient has. If the patient comes in with pneumonia, I open the pneumonia order set. And you can see here, this is the pneumonia order set. It already has the vital signs, the diet, the fluids, typical for a pneumonia patient. And I could click a box and say, I want this. Some are already pre-clicked for me. When it comes to medicines, if I'm treating a community-acquired pneumonia, you see I can choose up at the top, ceftriaxone and other antibiotics. However, you should never treat this disorder with only one antibiotic. You always have to use two. So the system makes it so that if I order one, I automatically order the other. I cannot mistakenly pick only one antibiotic. Also, if it's a certain severe atypical one, I'm, I'm given the option along with some education. And if my patient is severely allergic, I'm given the options to choose there. So these order sets are very good in that sense. If I ordered vancomycin, it would remind me to order the levels. It would help me in that sense. So this has been helpful for us to order the right antibiotics. Now, this has been a big issue. We have had too many people getting cultures who don't need cultures. If I get called at two o'clock in the morning by a nurse that says my patient has a fever and I say, culture everything, I want the nurse to say to me, doctor, I don't think we need to culture everything. The patient has a fever. There's a lot of secretions coming from here. There's no diarrhea. There's the urine is clear. Why should we be culturing the urine? Don't do it. The mess is up here. Now, granted, if they're unstable and critically ill, that's a different story. But you don't need to culture everything. And if there is a, do you have Foley catheters here? Foley catheters? If the Foley catheter has been in there for three days, we take it out, put a new one in, and get the sample then. Why do we want to test what's been living in the tube? We also make sure that if the urinalysis is normal, it stops the culture. Even if the doctor ordered a culture, it stops the culture. Because if the urinalysis is normal, we should not be getting a culture. Unless the doctor calls and says, no, for these reasons, I need the culture. Blood cultures, we get called that there's a gram positive growing in the blood. We have to wait a day, not anymore. We do genetic testing on the gram positive and we're told right then and there, it's enterococcus or it's staph aureus. Not only are we told is it staph aureus, we're told at three o'clock in the morning, it's sensitive to methicillin. Ah, stop the vancomycin, put them on a better antibiotic like uh, ceftazidine or um, methicillin or oxicillin, oxicillin, because those are better antibiotics. They get better outcomes. And if you have Staphylococcus aureus in the blood or a fungus in the blood, it's a mandatory infectious disease consult. And that's evidence-based. We have seen better outcomes, less mortality, shorter hospital stays when this was done. Now, I don't think that's being used here commonly, but SED rates and C-reactive proteins and others, but procalcitonin is a marker for severe bacterial infection. So if you come in with a respiratory infection that is proven, because we do test uh, for virus, it's proven to be a rhinovirus and the procalcitonin is low, we say, think about stopping the antibiotic. It's a viral illness. So this has helped us reduce antibiotics. And also, if you're started on vancomycin for a pneumonia, because we don't know the cause, we test the nose. If there's no staph in the nose, we feel as the patient has been doing okay the next day or two, we stop the vancomycin. So this has helped because we, do, do you all see vancomycin resistant enterococcus? 
Yeah, we, this is a germ we've had problems with, so we're lowering vancomycin use. And on this, we have seen less vancomycin resistance. So it's been helpful and it's also saved lives. Everybody coming into our intensive care unit gets mupirocin ointment in the nose, which kills MRSA and Staph aureus. And we give them chlorhexidine baths because it's the intensive care unit patients that may be going to surgery and we don't want surgical site infections. So we do decolonize everybody entering our unit. Okay, this is very important. I don't think that a lot of hospitals are doing this. If you order an antibiotic, we need to know why. In the past, we just knew how much antibiotics we were using. We want to know what we're using them for. So we do want to see that. And it actually has helped. I get notified whenever something is not quite right. Somebody was bitten by a cat, and they were given a first-generation cephalosporin. That does not cover for the infection that will develop after a cat bite. We were able to call and say, this is not the right antibiotic. The indication doesn't match. Now, the computer system actually helps us with this too by only putting the right indications down. So we do want to have it listed why you're using the antibiotic. That is very important. And what is the last day that you want this antibiotic? So please be considerate of, of stating at the beginning how many days. Now our system will actually stop the antibiotics automatically and alert the pharmacist to make sure that it matches with how the patient is doing. And we have a computer system that takes the microbiology result, matches it to the antibiotic, and if it doesn't match, it alerts the physician and the pharmacist. But we need to know how long you're treating for. Um, we do have pre-op antibiotics. These have to be given before you cut. This cannot be given after you cut. It has to be done before you cut. And if it's a severe allergy, uh, then you can use the alternative, but not if it's a mild allergy. Mild allergy, which is a rash, they're in a controlled situation with expert uh, anesthesiologists. I was supposed to say that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, they will monitor the airway if there's a problem. So, you know, if it's a mild penicillin allergy, we will still give the cephalosporin. And there's only one option. So this is an example of what we have, is if you're doing a GI procedure, all of these patients get cefotetin. If you look up in the research, there are multiple choices. We don't want to confuse all of our team members by having every single antibiotic being used. We say all of the procedures are this antibiotic. And the reason why, standard work saves lives. If it's the same every time, and somebody does something different by accident, and it's a mistake, it will be recognized. If everybody's just using whatever antibiotic they want, when the wrong one comes in, nobody will recognize it, and it will mistake will occur. So we make this very standard, and if there's a severe allergy, we note that there's this alternative. So we have this available um, for our patients. Now, when the patient has been here for a couple of days, as soon as we get the culture results, we must change the antibiotics if appropriate. If we have a cause, we de-escalate the antibiotic that was first started. The first antibiotic may have covered many germs. Now that we know more, we can narrow the antibiotic to kill just the germ we're looking for. And if they have been uh, use NPO, the nothing by mouth, and then now they can eat, now they can eat, now they may not need the IV antibiotic, depending upon the, the condition. So maybe we, we have a way to automatically switch them to an oral antibiotic as long as it's one that can be absorbed and they're not having nausea, they're not having vomiting. So we try to switch them because you don't want the IVs infected or overused and maybe you don't need that any further. So we have a safe way for some patients to switch from IV to oral if it's appropriate for the patient's condition and diagnosis. And we do stop every day and say, what is this patient's antibiotic? Is it necessary? Is it the right ant one? How many days are we gonna treat? And we do this, we do this timeout. Let's stop and make sure the antibiotic is appropriate. So I'll give you one, two last examples. For a common cold, an upper viral, viral respiratory condition, we tell the patients, you should not be treated 
unless you've been sick for nine days, as long as you're getting a little better each day, we should not be treating with an antibiotic. Now we would say, yes, if you're getting worse, but it's been getting worse for three days, okay, that probably could be a bacterial infection and we should give you an antibiotic. So if you've been sick for 10 days, that could be an antibiotic. If you've been getting worse for three days, or if you got worse, got better, and then got worse again, and fever and change in sputum, that's for an antibiotic. We've instituted this, but we put this in the waiting room. When the patient arrives, they see a sign, and the sign says, you may not get an antibiotic today, depending upon your condition. <laughs> you know? That way it's not a surprise when the doctor says this, because we have had, we have had people demand an antibiotic. So this helps to see the sign, and it's also given to them as a piece of paper, say you may not need an antibiotic. And actually today, we've actually had parents call us and say, your emergency room gave my child an antibiotic and my pediatrician is mad, is angry, because my child did not need an antibiotic. I just wanted to make sure their ears were okay, but it was a viral illness. Why did your doctor give an antibiotic? We're starting to see that. It's actually switching because of our education. So this is very important. You, you use fluoroquinolones here, right? Uh, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, probably some others. We at the, in the United States, we have put out warnings. Do not use these antibiotics unless it's severe because there are risks of Achilles tendon rupture, especially in older patients, those have been on steroids. This is a horrible complication. Along with muscle pains, heart arrhythmias, we have seen uh, neurologic problems and even confusion and hallucinations on ciprofloxacin and other fluoroquinolones, let alone the drug-drug interactions if they're on blood thinners, which we call warfarin. Uh, and then, of course, it changes the normal bacteria in your bowels. And it leaves behind one particular germ called Clostridium difficile. And when it becomes active, it produces a toxin and you get horrible diarrhea. And it's recurrent. Even after you treat it, it can come back again and again. So I think this has been one of our biggest problems and it can spread to other patients. Again, you gave the patient, you gave the patient ciprofloxacin, and they spread it to another patient you didn't even know, and now they're sick because of your prescription. <laughs> Granted, sometimes a patient's life is being saved because of a fluoroquinolone, but you wanna make sure it was used because of that reason. It was definitely needed. So we know this, we're running into problems with antibiotics, we know that there's additional costs, and those costs are not the cost of the antibiotic. It's the length of stay that's getting longer. It is the toxicity, the kidney toxicity. It is the longer hospital stays uh, and the adverse reactions that are adding up if we do not use antibiotics appropriately. So it's everyone's responsibility to educate our friends, our neighbors, our family members, at the nursing level, at the nursing home, at the clinic that antibiotics are life-saving, but they can cause problems. And if a clinician makes a mistake, we gently and friendly point it out, and we put it in writing in a very nice and friendly way. Sometimes the doctor will disagree with me and say, no, I needed this antibiotic for this reason, and we will take it back to the group and discuss it, and we may get back with that doctor and say, you were right. That was a good choice of antibiotic. You know, we were not aware of that. You helped educate and elevate the, the conversation. And we encourage everyone to be good stewards. So my last slide is we want the best drug used. We want the right amount used. And we want it for the right amount of time. A little more is not going to help. And we will find that we will still, with the evidence shown, cure and prevent, lower the dangers, and also prevent these superbugs from occurring. Uh, Dr. Fear.
Yes, yes, I did. Yes. Questions? <laughs> Comments? I did want to ask, are you seeing C. difficile? Yes, yes, of course. We've seen a lot of it in the last uh, six or eight weeks. We have, uh, are, are, are you doing fecal transplants? Yes, yes, yes. OK. So these have been working out well for us also. Yeah. Are you? I think, I think you could have called this lecture the common sense Voltaire lecture. It's very common sense, but common sense is not very common. But the reason is, is every day you are dealing with so much. You have many responsibilities, many illnesses, many medication issues. It is hard to say uh, this one issue is important because the cardiovascular approach to uh, heart attacks is going to be the important issue tomorrow or stroke. We've got to find a way as, as we're all often asked to do too much. But you're the experts in the area and you're working hard every day to solve these problems and educate people. This is yet another thing that is being asked of all of us is before it's too late, let's make sure our antibiotics remain successful. We have seen the ciprofloxacin, the, the, remember the numbers I showed you that were low? they have gotten better in our hospital. That antibiotic is now becoming more effective. We still don't use it because of side effects, but it's good to know it's more effective in case we have to use it if the patient's allergic to all the others. So it works, this has really helped us. Thank you for a good lecture. Um, I'm a surgeon and um, uh, we are really trying to have a simple case, three or four done. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that uh, you say that only severe allergies should stop using these uh, rules we are applying. And I know that this is not the case here. If we see a uh, uh, slightest sign of uh, uh, allergy for uh, for we, we give um, uh, separation for colorectal surgery, we give uh, um, uh, uh, separation and uh, clutching. Mm -hmm. And if there's a slightest chance of allergy uh, of, of something else, like on last uh, several, several days it was augmenting, they wanted to change it. And that is not necessarily according to what you say. You can still use it if it is not uh, swelling of tongue and uh, anaphylaxis. For, for pre-op antibiotics, correct. But if you're actually finding that there's been a perforation and you need to treat for a few more days, you have to, you have to be cautious and probably use the flagell or the other antibiotics because you're treating for multiple days after they leave the safety of the operating room. Well, I'm just mm -hmm. Yeah, we, for that we would rather deal with the mild side effect the patient has of hives and, and nausea or rash. We would rather deal with that small possibility because it may have happened 20, 30 years ago rather than give the alternative antibiotic. And we find that um, uh, if the allergy had occurred last week, yeah, we would, we would avoid it. But if it's been 20 years ago, we wouldn't. Yes, uh, well, I can remember the question. What about uh, chloramphenicol? Yeah, what, what happened to chloramphenicol? Yes, well, some of the, the, the Fanconi's anemia, the, the, the side effects, but we can't, nobody makes it where we are from. So they, they don't sell it, and <laughs> they, don't, they don't make it. It was for good for, and, and in fact, for some, some rare diseases, we have to try to get it for, from other countries. <laughs> yes, thank you for yes. excellent lecture. Uh, just to get back to the allergy question, and, and, and I think the key thing there is, is the question. Yes. Because I, I tend to do that when I see penicillin allergies because it's extremely common. Yes. <laughs> uh, and when I get this, uh, I got it as a child and I vomited or I, I felt a little strange or something like that, I said, well, that's not allergy. And if you get diarrhea after antibiotics, that's not an allergy. It's mm -hmm. a side effect. Excellent, and yes. You can get it no matter what. And I, I tend to take it out. Uh, Perfect. Yes, exactly. Uh, two questions. When I was in the States, we used to talk about uh, cross-contamination uh, back in the days, you know, decades ago, manufacturing between the cephalosporins yes. and the penicillins. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would have caused some reactions. And my second question would mm -hmm. be uh, a comment about procalcitonin, because mm -hmm. Dr. Nick uh, 
exist to measure CRPs and other things. <laughs> 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 but we do, we use CRP all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what the issues are, why we're not getting Broadcast yeah, it's a ch challenge because of the non specificity. Mm -hmm. It's not as expensive if used wisely. We have some doctors that are ordering it and they're not doing anything with the result. That to me is a waste. So, what we're doing is for specific diseases, severe infections. So, we don't allow it for a urine infection. We allow it for only severe infections like a severe pneumonia. If the procalcitonin is low, it doesn't mandate you stop antibiotics, but it does say maybe you need to trim back to oral antibiotics or go ahead and stop if the patient is clinically improving and it appears to be a viral illness. So that's a, if we I took it up in the laboratory a few years ago, uh, procalcitonin measurements, and as I understand, it was some investment in setting it up and yes. probably the uh, they wouldn't need it so often, really. Right, and the uh, cost for us, for our own individual, we were able to bring the test into the building. So, and we were able to do it within an hour. So the combination of that has helped. It may not, be, this may be a problem for other facilities and make it such that it's not as, as helpful. But the conversation does help because in the sense that you can't get the calcitonin, you can still think that this patient may not need the antibiotics and look for those opportunities to reduce if it's a viral illness. It's basically in the rare cases where an asymptomatic patient he has fever and he has no general infection. Exactly. something else. Yes, it is helpful there. Not, so very often that you are against this. Yeah, and then it can be rare. So for volume, we had the volume to, to justify it. And so why do you think things to say Otters. it's our, it's our uh, infection specialist? But you are our, uh, antibiotic uh, steward. <laughs> 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 we, we, we tend to ask, ask you, oh, do you know the status in Iceland? That's the problem in Iceland. Do they have a plan? Uh, well, the we, uh, uh, University, University Hospital in Reykjavik, the microbiology lab there, they they have their own antibiogram yes. on a national basis, yes. which mm -hmm. we can. Yeah, that is helpful because that will apply across across the area and is a great starting point. But sometimes for a hospital, the intensive care unit isolates can be helpful. Yeah, I think that can apply to all of us. That's what this is that big. I, I don't think we need our own antibiotics. Yeah. And we don't have the exposure. And we have the same data, but it's very short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I think the uh, last thing that it is in the beginning of setting up uh, antibiotics. Yeah, I, I, I know your family member brought it up about uh, CRP because I've been very against the amount of CRP is being done mm -hmm. with someone comes in with a pneumonia and it's pneumonia and it's clinically pneumonia yeah. and the CRP is taken, it will be taken days and days until the patient. CRP is better and then the patient's better, yeah. this sort of thing. How, how are the CRPs used in the States? Um, so in the, your, in your yeah, so the, the, C, the C reactive protein as a sign of the inflammatory response, it's being used more for patients with the hidden infections uh, that are not as obvious, such as osteomyelitis, and we, we follow that. The, for the very obvious bacterial infections, we avoid getting it, and we, we do, we, uh, we also find it helpful for the cases where you feel there may be an autoimmune. We had somebody come in with they thought was pneumonia. It was it was an autoimmune uh, uh, vasculitis, and seeing them not get much better on antibiotics, but the C-reactive protein stayed high. Steroids, and of course, auto, uh, then after that, they used other Im immune modulators, and they did great. Thank, Thank you all very much. They're trying to start an antibiotic stewardship program in the West Department, and they're having logistic issues mm -hmm. with staff and people and costs. And you know, they, they know what, what they want to do and how to do it. They just yeah, they aren't getting it. it's getting that team together with the authority of the hospital. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thanks for your help with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. You probably need to have all the people on board I'll because give you an yes. later. oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> because of the shopping around. Yes. Yeah.